Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, let, let's turn over to the book of Acts in chapter 1, Acts chapter 1. Now, if you're new with us this evening, we're in a two-year study on the Gospel of John, and you're going, well, that's good. We just turned to the book of Acts. So, uh, what's up with that? Uh, it's a two-year study in the Gospel of John, and we're in the second year of that study, looking at the second half of John's Gospel, what's called the Book of Passion. First half of John's Gospel, the Book of Signs. It, has, um, it is preceded by a prologue in which Jesus is introduced to us in seven different ways. And then those seven, there are seven signs that unfold out of those in the first 11 chapters of John that John very specifically uses to reveal who Jesus is. Here's his identity. This is who he is. And then this last part of John's gospel covers only one week, and the vast majority of that only one night, all leading up to the ultimate sign that leads us to faith which is Jesus' own death and resurrection. You'll remember the seventh sign was Lazarus' resurrection. But all of the signs, from the first, water to wine, and ultimately Jesus revealing Himself as the true bridegroom who provides the wine, who brings life, and then ultimately Lazarus' resurrection uh, from the grave. All of these point forward to Jesus giving life and through His own death and resurrection. So then the subject of Jesus' death and resurrection is the is what's before us in the second part of the Gospel of John. And we're in the middle of a discourse where Jesus is teaching the disciples, and it's just before His betrayal. And He gives them a lengthy bit of instruction on the person and work of the Holy Spirit. And we've been in those sections in John 14 and in John 16. And I promised you a kind of hit pause excursus on spirit baptism and spiritual gifts. And I want to try to do some of that with you this evening. We may not be able to tackle all of it. There's a new study guide this evening. Rinda's already uh, pointed out to me there's no artwork on it uh, tonight. And I apologize for that. It's messing up your entire (laughs) curriculum, I know. Well, maybe next week we'll get this redone with some artwork, you know, it's made in a hurry. But um, when you and I as believers in Jesus confess our faith together, whether we're using the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed, we have the Trinitarian formula, I believe in God the Father and in one Lord Jesus Christ, and then I believe in the Holy Spirit. And we mentioned last week about that extended portion of the Nicene Creed, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified. So the Holy Spirit is not an it, not a force. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's the third person of the Trinity, and He exists in perpetual, intimate communion with the Father and the Son, and He has been sent to glorify Jesus, which is to say, to not only bring us to life in Christ, but to continually point us to Jesus. There is characteristic in all the persons of the Holy Trinity the most profound humility, and it is not a a, a humility that we can even begin to relate to. Any, Any humility which is found in us is analogous to God's humility, but it is only a very, of course, very distant and imperfect echo. God's humility is a perfect humility which seeks the good continually of the other. And that begins within the relationships that are the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then, you'll remember this word perichoresis, the the dance of the persons, that in God's grace, He brings the bride of Christ into the intimate communion, the mutual indwelling of the persons of the Holy Trinity. So now we use inside language. Christ is in us, and we are in Christ. And we are loved by the Father with the very same love with which the Father loved the Son. We could meditate on that passage for years. We could go no further than just to meditate on the wonder that we are loved by God the Father with the very same love that God the Father loves God the Son. That is an extraordinary moment in Jesus' instruction. So then he comes to us and he starts talking to us about the person and work of the Holy Spirit. And in some of our previous teaching on this, when we looked at this, we, we have already, and if you missed it, you could go back a few weeks and catch it on the, on the web, uh, go back and look at a kind of Old Testament theology of the Holy Spirit. You can't open the Bible without running into the Holy Spirit. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And then God said, let there be light. So we have the Spirit of God, 
Uh, we have God, the, the creator. Uh, we, have, we have God, the word, all present there at that creation, taking chaos and turning it into cosmos. The spirit is the person, the atmosphere in which God's creative activity, his life-giving activity, his outshining activity, his glorying of all things takes place. And so when the spirit is at work, new creation is taking place, beauty is being revealed, and Christ is being magnified. Now that would be just a nice sermon outlined in and of itself if you were just preaching on Genesis chapter 1. But of course, all the way through the Old Testament, we find the Holy Spirit at work. But what's characteristic of the work of the Spirit in the Old Testament is limitation. The Holy Spirit works with particular individuals, and more often than not, in very temporary ways. So we find the Holy Spirit particularly related to prophets and priests and kings. And the Holy Spirit is given, but only in measure, and is not seen to be working in those kinds of ways, in the same kinds of ways, outside the boundaries of Israel. But there is an expectation in the Old Testament of a coming day of the Spirit's work, which will not be limited, an outpouring of the Spirit that knows no bounds. So Joel spoke of that. Joel chapter 2, behold, the days are coming, says your, your God, when I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, not just Jewish flesh. Gentiles will have the Holy Spirit too. And then he says, upon uh, um, male and female and young and old. And uh, he says, and, and that you will have the Holy Spirit on you and you shall prophesy. Peter picks up on that passage in Acts chapter 2 in his sermon to describe what God is doing in Pentecost. What God is doing at Pentecost is the fulfillment of that Old Testament expectation that a day would come when there would be a massive outpouring and a fusion of the Holy Spirit that would be universal in its nature and would be permanent in its nature. And Jesus himself was prophesied about concerning this by John the Baptist. You'll remember when Jesus comes for baptism, John points at him and he says a couple of things about him. Almost everybody knows the first one, the Agnus Dei. Behold, what? The Lamb of God, right? Who takes away the sins, not of Israel, but the world. So this cosmic redemptive work that Christ is going to accomplish. Transcends just being the one who dies for the sins of his people. He will, he will redeem the cosmos, okay? But then, secondly, he says, and he will baptize with the Holy Spirit in fire. So John prophesies that Jesus will be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and he will be the baptizer with the Holy Spirit. That's a very interesting phrase, and he's contrasting what Jesus is doing with what he's doing. John is baptizing with water. I'm baptizing you with water, but there is one coming after me, the thong of whose sandals I'm not worthy to unloose, to untie. He'll baptize you with the Spirit and fire. Spirit and fire. We'll come back to that language here in a few moments. Now, Jesus picks up on that prophecy from John, and it's here in Acts chapter 1, and that's where I've asked you to turn to. So, all of that to get us over here to Acts chapter 1. And it says, um, verse 4, let's just pick it up there. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which, he said, you've heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So let me just point out where we are, we're at in a sort of time frame because of that time, that time limitation there, not many days from now. This is Jesus after his death, after his burial, after his resurrection, and after a 40-day period in which he's been teaching the disciples. So they have a 40-day post-resurrection period seminar with Jesus about the kingdom. Wouldn't you like to have those tapes, right? That'd be, a good, that'd be a good teaching series right there. So he spends 40 days teaching them, it says, about, about the kingdom of God. And then it says he ascends. So the ascension is down in verse 9. After he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on and a cloud received him out of their sight and so on. So that's the ascension. 
So we're at the end of the 40 days after the resurrection, and we are right at the moment of Jesus' ascension into glory, and his disciples have been gathered to him, and he says, you're going to go out into all the world and bear witness about me, but don't leave yet. Don't leave yet because the promise of the Father concerning the Holy Spirit is about to be fulfilled. Don't leave. Don't leave. Wait. Wait in Jerusalem. Those same words are repeated over in Luke 24. Of course, Luke is the writer of Acts as well, so this is a little bridge portion here, putting together his gospel, uh, which is the, the story of Jesus, and then his second volume in the Jesus movement uh, biography, so to speak here, this Jesus movement history, is what Jesus continued to do through his people in the earth. So, he has Jesus quoting John the Baptist's prophecy. Now, what's interesting about that, among other things, is that it, John's, John the Baptist's prophecy has not yet been fulfilled. Now, remember, John said he's going to do two things, right? What was the first one? Lamb of God, take away sins. All right, that's, that's done, right? That's finished. Jesus dies on the cross, it is finished. So there's the Son of God. But here's Jesus saying, baptism with the Spirit and fire that John talked about hasn't happened yet. It hasn't been done yet. That's yet to come. So just before Jesus' ascension, he says that this prophecy will be fulfilled, and he puts a time reference to it. Verse 5, not many days from now. And uh, so they kind of thinking about times, and what is it? This time you're restoring the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know times or epochs, which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you'll receive power when the Spirit's come upon you. And you'll be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. And then comes the ascension. So Jesus ascends, leaving them in Jerusalem with the promise, not many days from now, the Holy Spirit will be poured out on you. So this is the final act of Jesus' apostolic mission. His uh, birth, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and then we come to this outpouring of the Spirit. And this is a part of Jesus' mission which is often ignored. It is often ignored. Uh, in many churches, the outpouring of the Spirit, Jesus' ascension ministry, doesn't get a lot of, doesn't get a lot of press. Uh, now, of course, if you grew up in a Pentecostal church or a charismatic church or something like that, then you would think, well, we were getting quite a bit of press, actually, uh, that, and, and, and maybe a bit of out of balance in the other direction. So I get it. That's fine. Uh, but what we want to try to do is find something of a, a middle ground here and just be thoroughly biblical. So Jesus says you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So let's go over to chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had come. They were all together in one place. That's Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Now, the day of Pentecost was 50 days, hence Penta, all right, 50. It's 50 days after Passover. So if you put the days all together, okay, there's the 40 days after the resurrection. This is about 10 days later, okay? So we're at the 50th day after Passover. So a week and a bit after Jesus says, not many days from now. So when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. It filled the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them tongues as a fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. There were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven, and when the sound occurred, the crowd came together. They were bewildered because each of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Why, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia... Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongues, these Galileans, speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? And that's the question before us tonight. 
We're going to ask the very same question. What does this mean? Others were mocking and saying, well, they're just full of new wine. In other words, they're, they're, they're drunk. Okay, so Peter's going to speak to that issue momentarily and to answer the question, what, what, does, it, what does it mean? All right. So a couple of things here to begin with. First of all, here's the fulfillment. This is set before us as the fulfillment of John the Baptist's prophecy. This is the ascended Jesus pouring out the Holy Spirit. Peter will make that very clear in his sermon. That's what's taking place. Jesus, the ascended Lord, is pouring out His Spirit on the church, which means He's baptizing them with the Holy Spirit. In fact, if you read over a little bit further in Acts chapter 2, and let's go over to verse 33 verse 33, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. So David's Lord is at the right hand of Yahweh until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Okay, so Peter, in in wrapping up his sermon, says that this outpouring that you've seen, this astonishing phenomena which has overtaken your senses, the sound of a violent rushing wind, tongues of fire resting on people's heads, speaking in languages that people have never learned, these phenomenon are a sign that the Spirit's outpouring has taken place. And John the Baptist's prophecy has been fulfilled, and Jesus is alive and is at the right hand of the Father. Now, that's a curious thing, isn't it? I mean, just on the surface of it, it's a curious thing. Because what is it about sounds of rushing wind and fire, the presence of fire, and speaking in languages that are foreign? What about that would indicate that someone else is now in charge? I mean, that seems arbitrary, but it isn't. It's deeply rooted in the Old Testament. Why fire? Why wind? Why languages? Now, I want to point out here at the outset that the word tongues simply means what? Languages. And a good indication of that is verse 11, Acts 2 verse 11. We hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And I want to mention that just at the outset because when you read that, and they were all speaking in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance, the word tongues, glossolalia, simply means languages. One of the things that sometimes happens is that people want to take the word tongues and classify it as a different form of ecstatic speech. But biblically, the word tongues is not a different category of speech. It is simply, it's a simply a word that means what? Languages. That's what it means. In the book of Revelation, when you see um, there were men around the throne from every tribe and tongue and people, what does that mean? It means they were from different language groups, right? And we, we um, even associate that with nations of people. For instance, you can talk about India as a geopolitical entity with lines on a map, but you can also think about how, how many... How many Uh, language groups, how many nations are there within India or, say, within China, all right? So forget the lines on the map. Think about people groups and languages and so on. If you work with Wycliffe Bible translators or you support any of their missionaries, you probably are more aware of the fact that there are a great many people, how many people groups and language groups there are in the world, some of which have never had the Scriptures translated into their own tongues, okay? So that's what the phrase is about. So it's not a separate category of ecstatic speech. It's languages. That's what the word means. And what kind of languages are these? Well, they're human languages. And that's an important thing to consider. These are human la- they're known human languages, which the people who are hearing it, in this particular case in Acts chapter 2, understand. Notice well that when John the Baptist said, Jesus will baptize with the Spirit, And Jesus said, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Peter described the Holy Spirit as being what? Poured out. Now, I just want to say that for the the benefit of all my Presbyterian friends here. For all of my non-immersion people, right? Because a lot of people will say, well, the word baptize means immerse. 
Well, it can mean immerse, but the meaning of words is not defined by etymology, which is to say it's, it's just basic meaning in a language. It's, it, the meaning of a word is based in its usage. And the word baptizo, bapto means to dip. That's the verb. And then the I-Z means uh, to cause to be, so to cause to be dipped. Baptizo can mean to cause to be immersed. There's nothing wrong with immersion. I'm not saying that. But if you limit it to that, you're limiting its scope in terms of usage. All right? So it, it, it would be a little bit like somebody, um, if, they, if they bury us all and our civilization disappears, and then they dig us up in a couple of thousand years, and, um, and they, they, look, they find a dictionary from 1920. Well, let's, let's make it a little closer. Let's say 1960. They find a Webster's Dictionary. The archaeologists dig up a Webster's Dictionary, and they look up the word gay. You tell me what the dictionary says. It's happy. And then they, they go, okay, and here we are. We're just a few years later, the archaeologists tell us, a couple, civilization a couple thousand years ago, and, and um, uh, there was a court, and they decided that gay marriage was right. And this made a tremendous difference in this particular culture in ancient history. Um, it appears that marriages got a lot happier um, all of a sudden. It was a tremendous happy marriage movement going on because clearly that's what the word means. All right. So, and you would go, well, they didn't get it. They didn't understand how the word was being used in our culture. Okay. So, usage is what's important. So, the word bapto or baptizo is part of a larger family group of words. And uh, in the book of Hebrews, it's used in a plural form, baptismois, baptismois, plural. Uh, where it talks about ritual washings of the Old Testament. Now, the ritual washings it's referring to um, are blood and water that were what on the priests? Sprinkled, sprinkled, okay? And then here, baptism is described as a what? An out pouring. So, sprinkling, pouring, immersion, all of those are biblical, biblical uses of the word baptize. It's so I say that for the benefit of all my Presbyterians who need to be affirmed in their faith and for all of my Baptist friends who think we've lost our minds. But there you are. So, Now, another important theological point needs to be made here, and that is that Jesus' work of being the one who pours out the Spirit, the one who gives the Spirit, it belongs to what's, thought, what's considered to be redemptive historical action. Now, what do I mean by that? Because that's a big old hairy phrase. Well, here's what I mean by redemptive historical action. There are certain things in the life of Christ which are of permanent significance but cannot be repeated. For instance, how significant is the conception of Jesus by the Spirit in the womb of Mary? Massive significance. Can it be repeated? Well, no. It's a once and for all. What would be another example of a once for all? The crucifixion. It's a once for all. And so you find in, in Christian life that you are identified with that once for all. You are crucified with Christ. Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. So the event which takes place in history is of permanent significance and it can't be repeated. Behold the Lamb of God. So do we need Jesus to be in, incarnate again? No, the incarnation is once for all. Do we need Jesus to be crucified again? No, we don't. Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, in the same way is a redemptive historical act. Because Jesus poured out the Spirit, He baptized with the Spirit whom? The church. He baptized the church with the Spirit and fire. And that is a once and for all moment. So John Murray, and I have that quote in your study guide there, it is a once and for all moment, but has it lost its significance? No. So here's how Murray summarizes it. While Pentecost cannot be repeated, neither can it be rescinded. So the very same Holy Spirit that's poured out on the church on the day of Pentecost is the same Holy Spirit who's at work in you. But do the phenomenon associated with that day of necessity find themselves being repeated? No. So, for instance, you might find people who say, well, I've spoken in tongues. Okay, 
But have you ever met anybody who said, and I had a flame of fire resting on my head? Well, no. And have you had anybody say, yes, and I had a tremendous rushing wind that was going on inside my, my Bible study? Well, no, that didn't happen either. All right, so, so we'll get to tongues in just a moment, but, but please remember that there is a cluster of supernatural phenomenon which are associated with this event which are not repeated. But Pentecost, so Pentecost, like the crucifixion and like the incarnation, like the resurrection, is a once and for all event into which all of God's people are brought so that the benefits of that once and for all event are your inheritance. You have lost nothing. And so when somebody says, you need to have your own new Pentecost, that might be overzealous language, and it might be really well-intended that says, that says, you need a fresh encounter with God, you need to return to the Lord, you, and I would say amen to all of that. But if it's technical theological language, then I would say, well, no, wait a minute. Okay, that's not really good theology, but I appreciate the zeal. Okay, so, so because you don't need a personal Pentecost any more than you need a personal incarnation or a personal crucifixion. If I said to you, did Jesus die for you, I hope you would say, yes. And are you benefiting from that now? Yes. Do you need it to be repeated for you personally? No, you don't. All right, you don't, need to be, you don't need to have Pentecost repeated for you personally, but you do need to know that personally, everything that took place on that day is your inheritance. But there are phenomena which are associated with that moment in history which are of particular significance. Now, this is important to note because, particularly in reference to tongues, it gets um, a little bit out of, out of the ballpark. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians 12. Remember, tongues are languages not a particular form of um, speech, which is meant to be ecstatic in nature. So in 1 Corinthians 12, there's a lengthy conversation that Paul gets into about spiritual gifts. Here, i got to give you a little background. Man, I really need the whiteboard on this tonight, but that's okay. Maybe I can take it up next time. But it goes like this. The Corinthians were using a word to describe spiritual phenomenon among them, and they were using the word pneumatikon. All right, which means spirituals, spirituals. So when Corinthians, what we call 1 Corinthians is Paul's response to a lot of their questions. And one of the things they're asking about, and Paul, you can always tell when Paul's answering one of their questions in 1 Corinthians by this phrase. It's in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1. Now concerning, so look at 1 Corinthians 12, 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren. Now when you see now concerning what he's doing is he's taking up one of their questions. You'll see that phrase repeated over and over again in 1 Corinthians. Now, concerning, and we might be saying, maybe we, maybe we would say it if we were answering a letter or an email, now about what you, and now about that, and now about this. So now concerning, but how many of you in your English translations have the word gifts italicized? Look at that real closely. Do you see it? What, what does it mean when it's italicized? It means it's not there in the original. Okay, it's been added by the English translators to give some sense to the verse because it, it seems weird to us. So what Paul says, now about spirituals, pneumatikon, that's their word. He's answering their letter to him. Now about spirituals, I don't want you to be ignorant. And he goes on to a variety of things, but then what he does is he does something tricky. He changes their language because apostles like to change stuff in churches to help them. And so he says in verse 4, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. Now he gives them a new word. He will take away, and he's going to do away with this little word pneumatikon, spirituals, and he's going to give them a new word. He's going to give them the word gift. And the word gift is charismata that he uses there, charismata. It's got the root word, which is charis, which is what Greek word? Anybody know? Grace, grace. And then mata means little. Okay, what's, what's, what's charismata? It's a little grace. It's a little grace. We might call it a gracelet, okay? <laughs> it's, a, it's a gracelet. It's, all right, so instead of calling it a spiritual, it's a, it's a grace. Now, why is that important? In Corinth, one of the problems was there was a great division in the church because some people were regarded as spiritual and some people weren't. 
Guess who's regarded as spiritual? People who have the most impressive phenomenological gifts. Okay? So if you have the gift of speaking in a language you've never learned, if you have a gift of prophesying, if you can heal the sick, then you're what? You're really spiritual. But if you're, a, if you're an administrator, if you have the gift of being an administrator, then maybe what? Not quite so spiritual, see. But Paul is going to make this case. He's going to say, you are all what? Spiritual. You're all spiritual because you all have the Spirit and you've all been given every one of you, gracelets, and there are varieties of them. There are varieties of gifts, he says, look at this, varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. Okay, well, we can go all through that, but let's go drop down to verse 11 and kind of of go in big language, sort of big chunks here. One and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. Now, verse 13 is extremely important in this discussion. For by, and it's the same Greek preposition, in or with, so by, with, or in, one spirit, We were all baptized into one body. Okay, so baptism with the Spirit. Baptism, and that's why I said that the prepositions there are very important. With, in, by. It's all the same. Baptized with the Spirit, by the Spirit, in the Spirit. We were all baptized in, with, by the Spirit. Okay, so let's just stop there. Paul's writing the Corinthian church. How many of the Corinthians are baptized in the Holy Spirit? All of them. All of them. And what is it that the Spirit does by baptizing them? He baptizes them into a body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Okay, so again, how many Corinthians have baptism with the Holy Spirit? Every one of them. Every one of them. Okay, now go to verse 27. You are Christ's body and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, then prophets, then teachers, then miracles gifts of healings, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. And then he gets into a rhetorical question sort of thing going on here. All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All don't have gifts of healing, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? Okay. So what's the answer to every one of Paul's rhetorical questions? No, no, they, no, not everybody does that. So what's Paul's point? How many are baptized with the Spirit? All. How many of them speak in tongues? Not all. How many of them heal? Not all. How many of them prophesy? Not all. So are any of those things the measure of a person's spirituality? No, no. And all gifts are actually what? Gifts, graces. They're just from God, whatever they are, okay? So, this gets into, this gets into what in the world this is supposed to mean. Now, I'm going to come back to Pentecost next week in the meaning of Pentecost, but I want to, since we got over here to Corinthians, I'm going to just jump ahead to Roman numeral number three in the last 15 minutes that I have tonight. And I want you to go over to 1 Corinthians 14, because here then, Paul begins, he, you know how 1 Corinthians 13 goes, um, where he rebukes them for their entire lack of love in their community. And um, by the way, if you look at, uh, let me do this before you move, chapter 13, or sh- chapter 12, uh, verse 31, uh, but earnestly desire the greater gifts. That's a Corinthian slogan. One of the other things that happens in Corinthians is they have slogans, and this is one of them. But earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. That's Paul quoting the Corinthians. That's not Paul telling you to do something. That's not prescriptive language. That is Paul quoting back to the Corinthians what they were saying. Earnestly desire the greater gifts as though they're what? Right. And Paul says, no, I'm going to show you a more excellent way. And then he begins to unfold what? The way of love. Okay. So... Then, chapter 14, 
Paul gets into this whole thing, chapter 14, verse 1, pursue love, yet earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. If you want spirituals, okay. And then he goes into a whole thing here about tongues and and what happens in tongues? If you speak in tongues, you don't speak to people but to God. Nobody understands. In your spirit, you speak mysteries. Okay, all this kind of stuff. Now, what does he say that tongues are really all about? What's, what is it going, what's going on with it? What is it about? Well, if you go down to verse 20 in chapter 14, and we can get into a whole discussion here in chapter 14 on the nature of tongues, but if you look at verse 20, brethren, do not be children in your thinking, but be in evil be infants, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written, by men of strange tongues and by the lips of strangers I will speak to this people, and even so they won't listen to me. So then, tongues are a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. Prophecy is a sign, not to unbelievers, but to those who believe. If the whole church assembles together and everybody speaks in tongues, the ungifted man or unbelievers enter, they'll say you're what? You're crazy. Crazy people. Okay. All right. What are tongues, who, who are tongues assigned to? Unbelievers. Let's stop for just a minute. Now, we've done our study in John's gospel about signs. Remember the whole first year, the book of signs. The very first time that the, word, the phrase signs and wonders shows up in the Bible is about Egypt. God did what in Egypt? Signs and wonders in Egypt. Okay, what's that referring to? Plagues. Okay, so you've seen the movie. You know what happened. All right, so Nile turns to blood and it culminates ultimately. I mean, there's frogs and flies and all kinds of stuff going on. And then it ultimately culminates in the uh, death of the firstborn uh, and, the, and, the, and the angel of death coming through. Okay, so those are, those are called what? Signs and wonders. Now, if you're a Jew and, and it's a sign... Okay, and that sign takes place. How do you feel about it? If you're a Jewish person living as a slave in Egypt and the sign of wonder takes place, how are you feeling? Bang on. If you're an Egyptian, not so much. Okay, so the, the sign that takes place is a sign both of blessing on the one hand, but also what? Curse and judgment. Don't forget that. Tongues are a sign to, to what? unbelievers. Tongues as a sign to unbelievers. If it's a sign to unbelievers, then it is always what? Judgment. Now, once you understand, you go, well, now, wait a minute. Tongues are a sign of what? Judgment. How does that figure? Okay, well, look where he's quoting from. Verse 21 by men of strange tongues, by the lips of strangers, I will speak to this people, and even so they will not listen to me. Paul is quoting here in 1 Corinthians 14, 21, a passage from the Old Testament. Now, if you look in your margin, if you have that with you, you'll see where that's from, and it's from the book of Isaiah. It's from the book of Isaiah, chapter 28. So let's go back there and see what that's about, Isaiah 28. Let's all come on back to Isaiah, see what, why Paul used this verse. Isaiah 28, and here, very significantly, Paul talks about what tongues judgment is all about. Isaiah 28, verse 11. This is a section where he is warning Judah. Verse 10, he says, order on order, order on order, line on line, line on line, a little here, a little there. Indeed, He, God, will speak to this people through stammering lips and a foreign tongue. He who said to them, here is rest, give rest to the weary, and here is repose, but they wouldn't listen. And so he says, God, God, you, God spoke to you, He sent His prophets, but you didn't listen. So now how is God going to speak to you? Through foreign tongues. Now I want you to stop and think about that for just a second. This is a prophecy that's coming to Judah. Listen to me, but you won't listen to me. If you won't listen to me through the prophets, you're going to have to learn to listen to me through foreign tongues. Where did God send them? Babylon. If you won't listen to me through the prophets, 
you will, you will listen in Babylonian. You will hear foreign tongues. You will go to Babylon, and there you will hear foreign tongues. And you go, well, that's a strange judgment, but it's not. In Deuteronomy 28, let's go, let's go back over there, Deuteronomy 28, because Isaiah is rooted further, even further back. Isaiah's prophecy here comes from Deuteronomy 28. Now, this is a section that, this is Moses' sermon just before they go into the promised land. And um, look at Deuteronomy 28, verse 47. And basically what you have in Deuteronomy 28 is, here's the blessing and here's the curse. So the first section of Deuteronomy 28 is, if you follow the Lord, you'll live in the land, and here's the blessing. If you go into idolatry and you serve other gods, then here's the curse. And what's, what's the primary curse on Israel if they become an idolatrous people in the promised land? What's the primary judgment? It's the same judgment that Adam and Eve suffered. And it's always the same judgment, exile. Adam and Eve in their original idolatrous rebellion against God will be our own gods. What did they suffer? Exile. They were moved out of the garden. Israel now is in the promised land, but if they become idolatrous people, they will be sent into exile. So look at Deuteronomy 28, verse 47. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and a glad heart for the abundance of all things, therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger, thirst, nakedness, lack of all things. He will put an iron yoke on your neck until he's destroyed you. The Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the ends of the earth, as the eagle swoops down, a nation whose language you don't understand. A nation of fierce countenance that will have no respect for the old nor should favor the long, young. And he and talks about besieging them and carrying them away. So then in Isaiah 28, it's really easy to remember this, by the way. It's Deuteronomy 28 and Isaiah 28. Isaiah, God sp- speaks through Isaiah and he says, you won't listen to me, so you're going to have to learn to listen to me in a foreign tongue. And when God's people go into exile and they're surrounded by foreign tongues, that is always a sign of what? Judgment. Tongues are a sign to the who? Unbelievers. It's, so if people are unbelieving, what are they incurring? God's what? Judgment, wrath, and here's the sign of it. And you go, okay, so here, let me just kind of put a wrap on this for, for tonight, and we'll pick it up next week. Suddenly, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues of fire resting upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues. Where are they? They're in Israel. In what city? They're in Jerusalem. What has Jesus said is going to befall Jerusalem? Judgment. What did Peter say that all of this phenomenon was a sign of? This Jesus, whom you crucified, is now what? Alive, and he's Lord, and he's ascended to the right hand of the Father. And he's poured out the Holy Spirit. And it's fire. What does fire do? Destroys, unless you're made out of what? Gold, gold, all right? So the wood, hay, and stubble is burned up. Now, what happens, we'll get into this next week, and we'll start looking at the prophecies of Isaiah 2 through 4 about how God would pour out His Spirit and fire on Jerusalem, because that's what John was talking about. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in His hand, all right? He's going to burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So the fire, the wind, the tongues, what are those signs of? Well, if you're a believer, they're signs of what? Life, blessing. But if you're an unbeliever, you don't, you're, you put Jesus on the cross, you refuse to believe in him, suddenly tongues are being spoken in Jerusalem, and they're foreign tongues. What is that a sign of? Jerusalem is now what? Under judgment. The judgment began the moment Jesus died. The moment Jesus died, the earth quaked, and something happened in the temple. What was it? The veil. veil was torn. That's the beginning of the demolition of the temple. Jesus said, 
ultimately, not one stone would be left on top of another. That's exactly what took place. He said, all these things will come upon this generation. Jesus' ascension to the right hand of the Father until all his enemies were put under his feet meant that judgment had come upon Jerusalem. But not just judgment, what else had come? Blessing. Because here's the other thing about Pentecost, and I'll stop with this and we'll pick it up next week. Pentecost was a celebration in Israel's life of the giving of the law. Moses went up on the mountain, and what came down? What does Moses go up into? What's up there? Smoke and fire. There's fire up there, man. And Moses goes up there. He goes up into the fire. He goes up into the wind. He goes up into the, goes up into the smoke. And then he comes down. And he comes down. He comes down out of the cloud. Moses descends to the people with the law. So here's the law. But on the day he gave the law, the day that he came down with the law, what was everybody doing down there? Partying. Partying. They're dancing. It's immorality, idolatry, and God's judgment came on the day that the law was given. How many people died that day, as it's saying in the book of Exodus? Anybody remember? How many people died that day? 3,000. On the day of Pentecost, when Jesus ascended and the spirit and the fire and the wind came down and the law was written not on tablets of stone but on the hearts of men, 3,000 people did not die. How many people on the day of Pentecost were saved? 3,000. Ooh. What's going on here? It's God coming to dwell with His people, and He's judging, and He's saying the old covenant's no more, and I'm going to write my law, as I said about the new covenant, I'm going to write it on the hearts of people and not on stone, and I'm going to dwell with my people, and this is a new covenant, and I'm judging all of the old, and all of that's going into exile, And now I'm going to march out into the whole world, and you're going to be witnesses in the whole world. Because this is not just for the people of Israel. This is for who? This is for everybody. Okay. So we've got to stop there. Hope that was fun, and uh, and we'll pick it up next week. Let's pray together. Uh, Father, we thank you for this and your word, and we pray that you would help us to rejoice in the gift of your spirit in Jesus' name.